If you follow the news closely, now today we're still paying closer attention to the war in Israel. And given the fact that today, not only the current Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, refused to negotiate with Hamas or any other conditions, given the fact that this nation today is suffering greatly, politically speaking, especially after the recent attack happened on October the 7th and directly from Hamas. But meanwhile, with regarding the presence of international community, and everyone is hoping that ceasefire solution should be able to place on the table. But meanwhile, it doesn't look like to be this way. Now, here's the question. When we are looking at the modern conflict uh, between uh, either a country with a terrorist group or even like the war in Ukraine between two countries, what kind of solution should we offer at this moment? And what about any other international players? Well, some believe that when we are looking at the war in Israel, the nation of Saudi Arabia plays also a crucial role at the same time. Well, what gives? And how should we understand the significance and also the inevitable help and support from Saudi Arabia? And does that mean the conflict or the war in Israel could influence the normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia at this moment? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to invite our distinguished speaker, and who is Professor Goss. Again, Professor Goss III It's a professor of international affairs and John H. Lindsay 44 chair at the Bush School of Government and the Public Service at Texas A&M University. Well, Professor Goss, and welcome to The Missing Piece. Thank you. Well, Professor Goss, again, as we mentioned before, Initially, when I discovered you, because this amazing article that you wrote, which is entitled, What the War in Gaza Means for Saudi Arabia. Now, I want to dive into the question right away. When we are looking at the conflict and the war in Israel, why is this so critical and important? We need to bring Saudi Arabia into the conversation. And also, what role does the country play at this moment when we look at the intensity of the war? So the Palestinian issue has been a, a popular issue for Arab publics for decades. Mm -hmm. And thus, the, the, whatever, whatever happens in the Israeli-Palestinian front has ripple effects throughout the Arab world. And uh, increasingly now throughout the Muslim world, even among non-Arab publics, whether it be in Iran or Turkey or even as far as Indonesia. Uh, and so the leaderships of the Arab states and the surrounding Muslim states, Turkey and Iran, have attempted to both uh, intervene in Palestinian questions as a result of pressure from their publics, but also to take advantage of uh, the regional commotion caused by the Palestinian issue to advance their own interests. Mm. Uh, and so for the last couple of decades, as Arab states have, uh, have inched closer to Israel, uh, you know, beginning with the Egyptian-Israeli peace way back in 1979, the Jordanian-Israeli peace in 1994, the negotiations in the 1990s between the Palestinians and Israel that led to the establishment of the Palestinian Authority, which currently uh, it doesn't exactly govern the West Bank, but it governs the West Bank kind of under Israeli occupation. Uh, as the Arab states have moved closer to Israel, Iran has picked up the banner of being uh, the leader of what it calls the axis of resistance. Mm. And that's uh, mostly non-state actors like Hamas and Hezbollah that are supported by Iran as Iran takes a very rejectionist stance toward the uh the whole idea of Israeli-Palestinian peace and a two-state solution. So Saudi Arabia is kind of in between. Mm. Uh, they never signed any agreements with Israel. However, in the last few years, the Saudis have begun to move closer to some kind of arrangement with the Israelis. Mm. Uh, and, the Isra and, and the Iranians, who uh, see the Saudis as their rivals in regional politics, have attempted to take advantage of that by branding the Saudis as, as you know, too close to America, too close to Israel. Mm. So it's a complicated game of responding to public pressure right, within your own country and also playing the regional politics balance power game. Mm. 
Professor, I want to dive into the article and read something to you and want to get your further explanation. And this is what you wrote, and I quote, The war leaves a Saudi crown prince, also known as MBS, in a difficult position, at least in the short term. He craves regional stability, which would make it easier for him to pursue his goal of diversifying Saudi Arabia's economy and reducing its reliance on oil exports. Now, two things that I think is crucial for us to discuss. Number one, Professor, what does that mean that for the uh, Saudi crown prince to pursue his goal of diversifying Saudi Arabia's economy? And also, what does that mean, the goal to reduce its reliance on oil export? So what are the two uh, uh, main explanations or indicators behind it? Go ahead. When uh, Mohammed bin Salman came into power when his father uh King Salman became king in 2015. One of the first things he did was issue a, a, a grand blueprint for the conversion of the Saudi economy. It was called Vision 2030. Mm. And it, it set out a number of guidelines and, and uh, signposts, as it were, to try to encourage the development of the private sector, encourage the, uh, the development of the non-oil sector, whether it be tourism, whether it be uh, entertainments, uh, Saudi Arabia, you know, notoriously uh, puritanical and closed down, has opened up under MBS in terms of the entertainment world. Uh, and so there's all sorts of efforts under the, the banner of Vision 2030 to encourage uh, non-oil economic productivity. Mm. Uh, some of that comes from uh, the state's own investments both domestically and in in foreign uh, foreign markets and, and and foreign investment so in order to do this to to you you need uh, incoming foreign investment into saudi arabia and it's much more likely to you to get that foreign investment if there's peace and stability in the middle east um, now, there's a certain irony here. The, the overall goal of Vision 2030 is to reduce Saudi Arabia's reliance on oil. But while this is all going on, Saudi Arabia is still very reliant on the sale of oil mm. to float its economy and fund this conversion. Uh, and thus, Saudi Arabia is also very concerned about the price of oil and maintaining the price of oil and maintaining its share of the market in oil. And so it's uh, I think that those two things are, uh, are, are the drivers right now of how Saudi Arabia views its regional policy. So when this blew up uh, on October 7th with the Hamas attack on Israel, uh, I think it threw a wrench into both the immediate issue of Israeli-Saudi relations mm. and it threw a wrench into this larger plan of trying to uh, attract foreign investment and foreign interest into Saudi Arabia for economic purposes. Mm. Now, Professor, I want to go back to the Saudi and uh, um, Israeli relationship. I mean, again, if I'm not mistaken, that before the attack happened on October 7th, the Crown Prince was interviewed by the state media. And also, of course, that he mentioned on the daily basis now, the relationship or the deal between Israel and Saudi were actually much closer. Now, when we look at the conflict, look at the war in Israel today, how should we assess the attitude from Saudi Arabia at this moment? I mean, again, you can't be a bench player, just watch every day how the war is being unfolded. And there's no way that you can be measured or you can't be challenged by those questions. So at this moment... How should we understand the role of Saudi Arabia when we look at this normalization or even say the possibility of normalization? And also for the bigger picture, how much more effort at this moment should both countries continue to invest? Or maybe at this moment, we should put it on hold. What do you think of that? It's on hold. Mm. Uh, there's no way that the Saudis are going to move forward with any kind of normalization of relations with Israel while Israeli troops are in Gaza mm. and while this crisis is going. I think that that's both something that uh, Saudi Arabia's own public opinion 
would be very much against. And I, I don't want to imply that Saudi Arabia is a democracy and that public opinion, mm. you know, guides its policies, but it's a consideration. And also, I think that, uh, you know, I, I just don't think any Arab leader would want to give the Israelis what appears to be a diplomatic win at a time when they're pulverizing the Palestinians. So I, I, it's not just public opinion. I think it's the personal opinion of, of the leadership. But the, the incentives that drove MBS to explore this, uh, a new and improved relationship with Israel are not going to go away. Mm. So I think it's on hold. So what are the Israelis doing now? Truthfully, they don't have much leverage on uh, Hamas. Hamas is the, the, the military wing of the Muslim Brotherhood in Palestine. Mm. So uh, it, 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 the Saudis have been very leery about the Muslim Brotherhood. They've opposed Muslim Brotherhood governments that emerged after the Arab Spring of 2011, most, most notably in Egypt, uh, because they, they don't like the kind of bottom-up popular mobilization Islamist politics that the Muslim Brotherhood represents. Mm. So they have, no, they have no particular desire to help Hamas. And Hamas is an ally of Iran, which is Saudi Arabia's rival. So it's not like the Saudis have much uh, leverage on Hamas. Uh, on the other hand, there's, uh, you know, many people in the United States are basically saying, well, the Saudis should come in with a lot of money to help the Palestinians govern. And after Israel, quote unquote, wins the war, they should they should go in and, and, and help govern Gaza. I don't think the Saudis want to do that either. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want to clean up Israeli messes. Uh, and and uh, they've never sent their troops outside their borders in a UN peacekeeping mission. Right? They've never uh, they've never extended themselves beyond their borders in any kind of governing mm. capacity. And I don't think that they're particularly interested in dumping a lot of money into Gaza unless there's some sense of a political program that's going to lead toward a, a Palestinian state mm. that will help to, uh, they hope, uh, prevent these kinds of blowups in the future. Mm. Professor, let's talk about, again, as we mentioned at the beginning of the intro, the current prime minister of Israel, which is Benjamin Netanyahu. How much do you think that because of the war in Israel that actually reduced the credibility of Benjamin and Yahoo, particularly towards or from the perspective, the Saudi prince. I mean, you know, you know, at this moment, as soon as the war broke out, on one hand, we understand it's devastating for the country and also it's devastating for the citizens. But meanwhile, I've read and also, again, a lot more international experts on, uh, from international relationships believe that it's time for Benjamin Netanyahu to step away. So in other words, to leave the post, you know, you are not the right person at this moment or because of your presence, Hamas was able to take advantage of this opportunity. Now, let's go back to, again, uh, from the Saudi, Arabia, Saudi Arabia's perspective, how much credibility does Benjamin Netanyahu have at this moment when we look at this relationship? Does that mean that Benjamin Netanyahu it's not able to see the actual normalization between the two countries since you mentioned it's on hold. So what would you say to that? So I think the Saudi view of Netanyahu is going to be uh, basically defined by the Israeli mm. view of Netanyahu. Uh, uh, Netanyahu is the great political survivor of Israeli politics. Mm. He's been prime minister now longer than anyone in Israeli history. He's prime minister despite the fact that he's uh, being investigated for corruption charges. Mm. Uh, he, uh, he seems to have a hold on Israeli politics that is you know, beyond what one would expect given his record. Mm. Now, that being said, I, I think that once this crisis is over, however we define over, there will be an accounting in Israeli politics for what happened. Mm. And I think uh, Netanyahu will be in some trouble then. The thing that he has going for him is that his uh, coalition, really the most right-wing coalition in Israeli history, 
needs him as much as he needs them. Mm -hmm. And I think that if he were forced to step down, you would more likely see a government that would not include all of these uh, far right groups mm. in it. But uh, and and we might need to we might see another election in Israel, right? Mm. That that might be the result of all this might be an election. But I think Netanyahu has a real interest in, in maintaining the sense of crisis because as long as that's there, he can claim that it's too early to do this kind of political accounting. Mm. From the Saudi point of view, I think they'll deal with whoever is prime minister of Israel. Mm. Professor, I want to talk about the foreign policy side for the Saudi crown prince. And again, we know when we talk about especially modern day, this economic interest, and we have to bring foreign policy. I mean, I, I, I don't want I don't want to use the word say the whole package. But again, it's a crucial piece when we look at this economic relationship. Now, at this moment, again, you mentioned in this article, from your perspective, what is the ultimate interest for Saudi Arabia when we look at the foreign policy? And does that mean I really wanted to have this good relationship in the Middle East with Arab countries? Or maybe I wanted to be, say, uh, a bridge, you know, to create better opportunities. Not only I am the recipients, but also along with other partners. What do you say to that? So I don't think that we can say that Saudi foreign policy is governed by only one single goal. Mm. Uh, I do think that that uh, there is a desire in Riyadh now to move away from what had been a, a relatively confrontational foreign policy that MBS pursued basically for the first five or six years when he was in power. Right, from 2015 to 2020, 2021 in there, uh, you know, what did he do? He, he, he ratcheted up the rhetoric with Iran. He uh, started the military intervention in Yemen. He uh, uh, blockaded Qatar. He, uh, in essence, kidnapped the Lebanese prime minister on a visit to Saudi Arabia, mm. forced his resignation to try to create a political crisis in Lebanon. And, uh, you know, ordered the, the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, a mm. Saudi journalist who had taken a, a, an oppositional stance to MBS and was living in the United States. He, he was killed in the, in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. So uh, this was a, a very aggressive foreign policy. And really, it, 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 it bore no positive results. Mm. Uh, it alienated uh, people in the United States, including President Biden. Uh, there, you know, the, the, the gambit into Lebanese politics didn't work. Hezbollah still was the most important player. Yemen is a quagmire. And the boycott of Qatar never really worked, and now it's over. So beginning really in 2020, 2021 in there, Saudi Arabia began to, I think, reassess its foreign policy. You now have a ceasefire that's basically holding in Yemen vis-a-vis -vis the, the Houthi movement and Saudi Arabia. You have uh, the end of the Qatar boycott and, and probably most notable, you have uh, a restoration of diplomatic relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia, mm. uh, brokered by China, mm. broker, brokered by the People's Republic. Mm. Uh, and, and all of this, I think, indicates a turn in Saudi foreign policy from kind of a very aggressive, you know, elbows out, we're going to throw our weight around, to but we need to be more cautious because uh, regional conflict really doesn't benefit us. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's the overall approach right now. Uh, but there's still worry about Iranian, uh, the spread of Iranian influence in the Arab world. Mm. And there is worry that, you know, a, continu a continuing uh, Israeli-Palestinian war could spill over into other uh, other fronts, mm. into Lebanon, mm. and could benefit Iran. Mm. Professor, two more questions before letting you go. Now, since you mentioned China, let's bring China into our conversation. Again, going back to the article, something you wrote. And I quote, Saudi Arabia reached out to China to mediate a 
resumption of diplomatic relationship with Iran this year. All of this was done in the name of MBS Economic Reform Program. Again, as we mentioned before, Vision 2030. Now, let's talk about this. We know in China today, we look at the country with political ambition, economic unpredictability at this moment. But meanwhile, for China today, another similar project, which is Belt and Road Initiative. I mean, again, it's well known to the world. We have to say, in reality, some countries are very much into this project and heavily involved. Other countries, either they have already pulled away from it or they just never show any interest. Now, Professor, question to you. For Saudi Arabia to reach out to China and continue this Vision 2030, meanwhile, we're looking at China's Belt and Road Initiative. What does that mean for the two countries? Is it cooperation or is it competitor or any other sense of understanding behind it? What do you say to that? So this, the, the, the simple reason that the Saudis reached out to China for mediation with Iran is that the other great power, the United States, uh, doesn't have any diplomatic relations with Iran. Mm. And so if, if, you want, if you want to deal with Iran, China is the natural go-between and also to some extent the guarantor. That's right. And I think this is where the Chinese might be finding that uh, that playing the, the great power politics game in the Middle East isn't all fun. Mm. Uh, because I think that that to the extent that uh, the Saudis look at Iran and say Iran's not living up to the terms of the deal, they go to Beijing and they say, this is your deal. You make the Iranians do this. Mm. Uh, and so I, I think that, you know, there's a there's a cost to be paid to to play the great power game in the Middle East and the Chinese might be starting to feel that. So that's the, that's the short, that's the short term. Mm. Uh, in the longer term, uh, Saudi Arabia's largest customer for its energy exports is China. Mm. And up until very recently, up until the, the Ukraine war switched around oil uh, flows, uh, Saudi Arabia was China's largest uh, supplier of, of oil. Now Russia is, but Saudi Arabia is number two. And so the, there's a natural uh, desire on both sides to maintain an economic relationship. And, and you know, China also is uh, sells a lot of stuff mm. to Saudi Arabia. Um, the question that I think is remains unanswered, at least in my mind, is, is what kind of role does China want to play in the Middle East? Mm. Up until now, it's largely been an economic role. Uh, they wanted to have good relations with everybody. Right. Buy and sell with Iran, buy and sell with with Saudi Arabia, buy and sell with Israel. Right. Buy and sell with everybody. Don't get involved with the politics. Uh, uh, but now as China's power grows and its ambitions grow, does it want to play a more geostrategic role in the region? Mm. Uh, and I think a lot of this depends on whether Ch uh, Chinese leaders think like economists or think like political scientists. Mm. They think like economists, they'll say, we want to be friends with everybody. We want to trade with everybody. We've got business to do. And uh, the United States basically has the same interest as we do in making sure oil and energy flow out of the region. So why uh, why, why get in a big uh, uh, contest for influence mm. in the Middle East? Mm. We'll just free ride on this. Mm. I think that's what an economist would say. But a political scientist would say we have to secure our energy resources. We have to secure our trade routes. Uh, who's our major competitor? It's the United States. If there's a crisis with the United States, cut off our trade routes. We have to have a military presence. I think that that's a huge choice that China is facing in mm. how it's going to deal with the Middle East. Mm. Well, Professor, I want to wrap up our conversation by going back to the article. Towards the end of the article, and this is something you wrote, and again, uh, you're, I want to get your final thoughts. Even when the U.S. can refocus on Israeli-Saudi diplomacy, it must also consider whether the price of Israeli-Saudi normalization is worth the cost of, U of new U.S. military commitment and the greater risk of nuclear weapon proliferation in the region. Now, Professor, I want to get your final thoughts regarding this new U.S. military commitment. 
Why is that significant? We need to bring the commitment from the U.S. military perspective. And again, right now, this seems to be a very hot topic, whether we should com continue to build U.S. military presence or we should pull back. So I want to hear your final thoughts regarding this U.S. military commitment when we look at this Saudi and Israeli normalization. Your final thoughts. The Saudis have been very clear about the 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 cost hmm. to the United States of a Saudi-Israeli deal. Uh, this goes back, I think, to to a larger uh, fact, which is that ev every Arab deal with Israel has basically been an Arab deal with the United States, hmm. whether it was the dot uh, signing a peace treaty with Israel. Uh, and getting foreign aid and trade and, and moving into the, if you will, the American camp in the Cold War, whether it was Jordan you know, signing the peace treaty in 94 and getting back in America's good graces after it had backed Saddam Hussein in the Gulf War of 1990-91, or the most recent Abraham Accords, where every one of the Arab countries that established relations with Israel got something from the United States. Hmm. And the Saudis want certain things from the United States if they're going to do this deal with Israel. And the two that have been most prominent are they want a, 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 a formal security guarantee from the United States. The United States will, will come to their aid if they are attacked. Mm. Uh, the United States has never given that kind of formal guarantee, even though the United States did in the Gulf War of 1990-91 send half a million troops into mm. the... Persian Gulf Arabian Peninsula area to turn back Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait, hmm. which was basically about protecting Saudi Arabia. Uh, but the Saudis want that in writing. Uh, they were kind of spooked in 2019 when the Iranians attacked uh, Saudi oil facilities and the United States basically did nothing in response. So they want that formal security guarantee. Uh, Saudi Arabia is not the most popular country in the U.S. Congress. Whether that kind of guarantee could get through with a majority of congressional support is an open question. The other thing that the Saudis want is they want uh, cooperation from the United States in building uh, a, a, a nuclear infrastructure in Saudi Arabia. Now, the Saudis contend this would be for peaceful purposes. I, I don't doubt them. But on the other hand, they're insisting that that some of the safeguards that the United States has has placed on other nuclear deals with other countries that would prevent uh, the the ability to convert these programs into weapons production. Mm. Uh, the Saudis don't want to have those safeguards. Uh, and so one wonders why. I mean, I think that if I were a Saudi and I, I looked at the Israelis with nuclear weapons and the Iranians developing a, a program that could easily convert into nuclear weapons at a very short amount of time, I would want to maintain that option too. But uh, the United States is very committed to uh, preventing nuclear proliferation in the Middle East, not not vis-a-vis -vis Israel, but vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Hmm. And... Uh, and the kinds of, the kind of program Saudi Arabia wants to build might increase the prospect of proliferation. So these are, are very serious questions that the United States would have to confront. Again, I really agree with you because as we are looking at the war in Israel, and again, as we mentioned before, no one can be a single bench player. I mean, again, you have to think about the short term uh, a relationship and also the bigger picture. Well, again, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to speak to Professor Goss. Again, Professor Goss III is the Professor of International Affairs and John H. Lindsay, 44 Chair at the Bush School of Government and the Public Service at Texas AM University. Well, Professor, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it.